sweet hour of prayer. I mentioned this before. It's one thing that we need so desperately in our Christian walk, but it's one thing we're going to leave behind when we leave this earth. When we step into heaven, we won't need prayer anymore. We'll, have, we'll be in the presence of Jesus, and we're talking face to face with him. And that's one thing we get to leave on the earth here, but it's one thing we need the most while we're here as we walk this earth is that sweet hour of prayer. Thank you for that this morning. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now we're getting back into our message on the gospel, sharing the gospel. Last week we shared about the reality of the gospel, or the reality of hell, and how it, uh, it's real. It's a real place. One thing I didn't mention last week is the difference between a parable and the difference between a, a, a story that's, that's real, uh, a real person. Whenever Jesus, when he's, when he's speaking, and he uses a person's name, it's, it's something that's real. It's a real place, it's a real person, and it's real. If he gives a parable, he doesn't use a person's name in it. He just uses uh, a widow, or he uses a servant, or a master, or a king. So when he gives parables, that's how you can tell the difference between a parable and if it's a real a, a reality that's taking place. It's real, it's there. And so Lazarus was in that story, and his name was given, so we know it's real. Hell is a real place, and people are there, and they're waiting for eternity to, to come. Now as we consider the gospel, sharing the gospel, I'm going to, I want to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. You know, it seems like the gospel has lost its urgency. Has, and it, don't, don't you think we're, we're living in a culture today where the urgency to get the gospel out just doesn't seem to be there anymore. It doesn't, doesn't have that... Years ago, it just seemed like the gospel had to get out. We couldn't get it out fast enough. But today, it's like the church has gone to sleep. The closer we're getting to the return of Christ, it should be more. We should be more active at getting the gospel out. We should be more excited about the gospel, more excited about reaching people, getting out there. What can we do to get the gospel out? Aren't you thankful that we're all not made the same, that we're not all, everybody looks like Rick or everybody looks like Dan? Aren't you glad that we're all different, <laughs> that God has, has, has made every person different in this, in this world? Well, you know, in that, in that creation, I'm thankful that God has done the same thing in sharing the gospel. The gospel message never changes. The gospel doesn't change. How to get to heaven doesn't change, but sometimes how we present the gospel can change. Sometimes how we can come up with ways that we can get the message out there. When we were on vacation, we were talking to my sister. My niece had gotten saved, but she went to a festival like the Boardwalk Festival. There was this older couple that was retired. They had set up a, a tent, you know, one of those art tents, and they had three doors set there, and they had a sign there that said, three things God can't do. And you had to open the door and look, and then there was a sign hanging that would say that each item that, that God, three things that God can't do. Would that get your attention? If you were walking down through a festival and seeing a sign that said three things God can't do, would just your curiosity take you there and want to find out what they're talking about? People are using their imagination. We need to use our imagination to get the gospel out. And through that experience, she went there, talked to the lady. The lady explained each item that God couldn't do. And through it, she was able to share the gospel with her, and my niece got saved. I don't know how many more got saved, but this couple would go to different festivals, pay for that spot in the festival, put, on that, put up that little booth, and share the gospel. And they were going around, and then they'd make a list of the kids. They had some material to hand out. Or whoever, adults, kids, whoever, they had material to give them to help them in their Christian walk. But they were evangelizing and they were using their ability and their, their imagination and their talent. And we think that if we can't walk somebody through the Romans road, or if we have to go up to a house and knock on that door, you're going to hell, this is how you get saved. There's so many different ways. We, God has given us a mind, let us use it for the gospel. Let us use it to get the gospel out there. And this, this couple is doing that. I mean, what a fantastic thing to do, to go out there. And you're probably wondering, well, what are the three things God can't do? Does anybody know three things that God can't do? He can't lie. That's one of them. His word is truth. There isn't one lie in this book. He can never lie. 
What's the other thing? Hate. What's that? He can't hate. He can't. Well, in the same, yeah, he can't hate. He can never send. He can never send a re, a person who repents to hell. He has to receive everyone that repents. Yeah, God doesn't hate. There's no hate in God. There's, there's probably more than three things. This, this, this couple had three things listed there. And uh, it's, it's amazing if we would just use our talents and our abilities to spread the gospel and get it out there and, and allow God to work. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm going to begin reading with verse 16. And this is Paul sharing his heart about sharing the gospel. This is Paul saying, the gospel's burning within me. Why isn't it burning within the church today? Why isn't it burning within our lives? Why do we, why do we just, we, we just don't want to get in somebody's face. We just don't want to make somebody uncomfortable. We live in this world where we want to keep everybody happy. And we wanna, we're afraid that we may make somebody uncomfortable. Well, the gospel is supposed to make a person uncomfortable because they're headed for hell. They're supposed to be challenged by the gospel. But listen to what Paul says here. For, for though I preach the gospel, I am nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, or a trust is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without change, charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. You know, there's, there's four things that stick out to me in this passage here. About Paul. Paul here is sharing about, I have to share the gospel. When you look through the life of Paul, he shares the gospel. And he shares in different ways. Remember on Mars Hill, what does he say? How, how does he present the gospel? When he got up on Mars Hill, he sees all these, all these different temples and these di different little statues set up, worshiping all these gods, every god possible that they could find, they were worshiping up there. And then he comes across one, one little spot set up, and there's a, sing there's, a, there's a sign there. And what does that sign say? Anybody know? To the unknown god. They even set up a shrine to the unknown God in case we offend somebody. What does Paul do? Paul ceases the moment and says, I'm going to tell you who the unknown God is. And he's the only God. But he grabs that and uses it. And then when he's in front of um, Agrippa, what does he say? Agrippa, this is how I got saved. I was struck by a light. He shares what happened to him personally. So many times when you read through the Paul the life of Paul, he shares the gospel by how he was, how Jesus came into his life. If you're saved, you have a testimony, and you can share the gospel through your testimony. There's so many ways we can share the gospel. But the first part here, Paul mentioned, mentions about, <clears throat> he says, I have, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. You know, the gospel is not about us. The gospel was not about Paul. The gospel is not about you. So often we worry about us when we're presenting the gospel, don't we? So often we think, what would this person think of me? You know, what is this person going to, how is this person going to respond? You know, do, am, I, am I going against the grain here if I share the gospel? Paul says it's not about us. It's not about my glory. It's not about people liking us. It's not about all these things that go through our mind, all the excuses that hit us about why we don't share the gospel. What is your excuse today? What is your excuse for not sharing the gospel? And Paul says here, first of all, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about my glory. It's about his glory. And then he goes on to say here, <clears throat> but it, for necessity is laid upon me. You know, necessity. Paul says this is, this is necessary. It's a necessity in my life. Do you feel in your life that it's a necessity to share the gospel? Is it a necessity in your life to share the gospel? We're commissioned, all of us, to share the gospel. It's, it should be an honor. 
It should be such an honor that God would choose us, imperfect people that we are. I mean, we try to live perfect here, but we know we're all imperfect. But he's chosen a perfect message, the perfect gospel, placed it in our hands to share. And Paul says it's a necessity that we share it. We have to share it. There's no, do you want to share it or not? It's a necessity. We have to share it. And he even says, woe, woe is me if I don't share it. Woe is me if I don't, if I don't go out there and share the gospel. Has anybody, does anybody, years ago, there was a group called the Navigators. Has anybody ever heard that group before? When I was first saved back in the late 70s and then in the early 80s, there was a group called the Navigators. It was, it was, a, it was kind of a, a group of college people, um, maybe a little bit older than college group. Um, but they were, it was, maybe it was more of a northern group that had that started to form. But uh, they were very much into um, witnessing, studying God's word, memorization. Um, they kind of brought a group together of accountability. The man that started it was Dawson Totman, and he was the founder of the Navigators. Now, I don't even know if it still exists today or not. But they had, they had material for memorization. Are they still going, Sarah? Okay, so it's more of a western, northern thing probably if the South, if the South hasn't heard of them. But they, were, they started back probably in the 70s. It's when it started maybe in the 60s. But they were, they, they, then they formed a group. Have you ever heard of the Minute? Did you ever hear of the Minutemen? Well, he started a group called the Minutemen. And in this little group, they, they were, a group came together and they were accountable to one another. And in their group, they had decided, this was not legalism or anything else, but they said, we're going to make a commitment together because we're going to take the gospel seriously and we're going to share the gospel with one person a day. One person a day, each of us. We're going to share the gospel. Before you go to bed, you're going to share the gospel. I don't know if they set a timeline, how long they would do this for, but they... They started to do that. And then every time they'd see each other, they had to give an account of who they shared the gospel with. But he writes in his biography, he writes, he writes, one night I went to bed. I went to bed and I realized as I was laying down in bed, I didn't share the gospel today with somebody. So what would you do if you're in his situation? Most of us would say, I'll do two tomorrow. <laughs> I'll do two tomorrow. That's, that's how I usually think. I'm like, okay, I'll do two tomorrow. He doesn't do that. He gets up out of bed, gets dressed, jumps into his Model T. Actually, it's before the 70s and 60s because he gets into a Model T. And he heads down the road. And he says he drives miles looking for somebody to share the gospel with. That's a necessity. How many of us would do that? How many of us would get up and go driving through town looking for somebody? And if I can't find somebody in Newland that's up, because they usually go to bed about 8 o'clock at night, I'd go to Boone. But I would go somewhere till I found a human being and I could ask them about Jesus. He drove around, drove around. And all of a sudden he found a man that had missed his bus. And it was down in Florida. And he, he, he stopped and he said, you need a ride. He said, yeah, I need a ride. I forget where he was going to. He gets in the car. He said, this is kind of weird what I'm going to tell you, but I had made a commitment to God and I'm going to witness to somebody every day. And I forgot to and I had to get up and he tells him his story. And the guy says, I've been looking for the answer for 20 years. I've been going to churches and tonight you told me what I needed to hear. And he received Jesus Christ. Getting out of bed, getting in a car, starting it up, driving around town until he finds a person. We don't have that today, do we? We don't have that kind of commitment to the gospel today. It's missing. It's, it, the church has gone to sleep. We've watered it down. We try to make everything comfortable. We try to make the churches so that, so that the unsaved, when they come into the church, they'll feel comfortable when they're sitting through church. The gospel, we're carrying a message of salvation. Hell is real. Salvation is available. 
Jesus is real. His crucifixion on the cross is real. God chose us. And what an honor to carry that message to a lost and dying world. Men and women back then had a commitment that they were going to carry the gospel. They were going to get the gospel out there regardless of the cost. People made a, a commitment to one another, made each other accountable. We're going to carry that gospel out. We're going to get the message out there. It doesn't happen like that today anymore, does it? We don't see that anymore. The church needs to rise up. The gospel hasn't changed. The need hasn't changed. What has changed? We have changed. We have changed. We need to wake up and have that same that same drive that Paul had, that these men and women had. The gospel has to get out. People are dying. People are going to hell. Hell is real. It's a reality that is there. The next part he brings up here is, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. I have a blessing. God, God has such a blessing. Can you imagine the rejoicing when he got in that vehicle and was driving with that man, sharing with him, hearing his story, he sharing his story, the two came together, that man giving his life to Christ. What a blessing. God blesses when we, when we surrender our will, our, our wants, our needs to the gospel's sake, for the gospel's sake. And we get into it and we do it. There's a blessing, there's a reward that God has for us. But Paul doesn't stop there. What does he say here? He says, but if against my will, a dispensation. Now what is he saying here? If Even if I don't want to do it, God has entrusted me. Dispensation means he's entrusted me with the gospel. I don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. None of us has a choice. He has entrusted us with his message of the gospel. He could have chose anything else, anyone else. He could have chose anything to get the gospel. He could have chose the rocks to sing out the gospel. He chose us. And he's entrusted us with the gospel to present it to a lost world. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Even if we do it unwillingly, do it. Even if we're making excuses... You can write the gospel and send it to somebody. You can pick up the phone and call somebody. You can make a, a tent with three doors in it and present the gospel. Use our imagination. Use, use the abilities that God has given us. Let us come together and get the gospel out. Let us not just sit back and say, yeah, that, we need to do that. We need to do that. We'll get to that next week. We'll, we'll get to it next month. We need to do that. The gospel needs to get out every day. It's real. People are dying every day. Every, we come together, we pray for people, and they're dying. Death is real, and people die. And the gospel needs to be got, gotten out and gotten to people. I want to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We did a message on this a while back when we first came to the church, but I want to touch, I want to touch on these verses again. Because these, this is, tells us who we are in Christ. You know, we read the first part. We love that first part. It says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? New creature. He's a new creation in Christ. He's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become brand new, don't they? When a person receives Christ, Something happens. Something happens when a person receives Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And then verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled himself, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And what has he done because of that? And hath given us to us the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? He's given us a ministry of reconciliation. He saved us. It says in the first part. Now that he has saved us, he has given us the ministry 
of taking that message to another person so they can be saved. And look what else he says here. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling, this is the message we have, reconciling the world to himself, unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He has given us this ministry. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say pastors. It doesn't say deacons. It doesn't say elders. Everyone who has come to Christ, who is a new creation as Christ, what is the first thing he says here? If you have become a believer in Christ and a follower of Christ, the very first thing he says is, you are now a, you are now a minister of the, of the gospel. You are now given that ministry. Very first thing he says. The most important thing on his, on, on his mind. And he goes on to say, now, and I love verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you. Another word you could put there is beg. As though God did beg through you, be reconciled to God. Beseech you, that's what, that's what he's saying here. God is begging through us to the world, be reconciled. Come to Jesus Christ. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look at verse, chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him. God is working through us and in us to reconcile the world. We are ambassadors. What does that mean? We're ambassadors. We are carrying the message of the king. We're not carrying our own message. When there's an ambassador for our country in, in another land, he carries the message of our leader. He is there to be the spokesperson taking what our leader says and speak it to them. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are carrying his message. He's given us the message. He says, now you're my ambassadors. Plead to this world. Be reconciled. Be saved. Come to Jesus Christ. We carry that message. What's our excuse today? What's the excuse we have? And he says, I love verse chapter one or chapter six, verse one. We're not alone doing this. We are workers together with him. Because he has placed the Holy Spirit within us. He says, I'll give you the words. All we have to do is be willing. All we have to do is step out and be willing. I remember reading a story about how D.L. Moody got saved. Did you ever read that story? Did you ever see how D.L. Moody got saved? A Sunday school teacher. D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman working in a shoe store selling shoes. And, a, and a, his Sunday school teacher became so burdened for him one day, he headed downtown to, to talk to him. And he said, I wasn't going to leave until I shared the gospel with him and made sure he was saved. And as he's getting there, guess what happened as he's walking to go share the message with D.L. Moody? His thoughts start, oh, maybe this isn't a good time. He's working right now. Maybe I, maybe, maybe I shouldn't interrupt him. Or maybe his co-workers will make fun of him after I leave. And he's, on all these excuses, all of a sudden start rattling, running through his mind. And, he's, and he's, he's rejecting each one. No, no. And I guarantee you, when you go to share the gospel, excuses are going to come. They're going to keep hitting you. They're going to keep hitting you. And you've got to keep pushing them down and pushing them down because you're carrying the message. And that's what this guy, this guy was in, he was in such an argument with himself that he walked right by the store. Then he all of a sudden realizes that he walked by the store, he turns around and runs back in, and he finds D.L. Moody sitting in the back storeroom, sorting out shoes. And he goes in there, and he starts to talk with him. And, 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 and while he's talking to him, D.L. Moody surrenders his life to Jesus Christ and gets saved. A Sunday school teacher goes and carries the gospel to D.L. Moody, and you know the story of D.L. Moody. Because the faithfulness of a Sunday school teacher 
teacher with the urgency to get the gospel out. And God does the work. We need that urgency today. We need to pray for it. We need to pray for that necessity in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, we've fallen asleep. We don't carry the message the same way that they carried it back then. The church needs to wake up. We need to wake up and carry that message to Jesus. We got a visitor out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to carry that message. Don't make excuses. Stop those excuses out. We need to come together and commit to one another that we're going to share the gospel with a person. I'm going to ask Dr. if she can maybe find some tracks that we can get here at the church that people can take. We need to have opportunity for people. I know we're in a busy world, and you only see people for a moment. But even if you can have, have, hand a person a track and say, this message changed my life forever, please read it. Even if we got something we can put in somebody's hand that they can read. Even if you can write a note to somebody and send it to them. Or pick up the phone and call them and share the gospel. We need to get the gospel out. We need to wake up. And we need to have that urgency that Paul had, that other people had, that the early church had. And even the church before us had. You can think back to earlier years, I bet. And there was, it seemed like there was an urgency to get the gospel out, wasn't there? It seemed like there was just that need to get that gospel out. We don't have it anymore. I don't see it in our land anymore. I don't see it in the church anymore. We need to wake up. We need to ask God to put that urgency in my heart. Put that urgency in my mind. Let us get the gospel out. Let's all stand this morning. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for men and women that have gone before us, that have showed us the way. We thank you for their testimony, their lives, that they knew that they were carrying the most precious gift in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Father, there's something that's kind of been lost in our culture and in our life and in the church. We ask you now to bring that urgency into our hearts, into our lives. Help us to realize the honor it is to be your ambassadors. To realize that you have given us a responsibility. And we need to fulfill that responsibility as we walk through this life. Help us to become men and women and young people that carry your message proudly. That carry your message not in shame. But we carry it as the only true message of salvation, the only true message that can rescue a person from everything that they have to deal with in this life. If it's pain, if it's suffering, if it's addictions, if it's, if it's depression, no matter what it is, you have the answer and it's found in Jesus Christ and we're carrying that answer. Please, Father, through your spirit, challenge our hearts and our lives to become the ambassadors that you want us to be. We thank you for allowing us the opportunity to carry such a wonderful message to a lost and dying world. And we ask you now just to do a work in each of our hearts as only you can. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What song are we closing with?